So our next speaker is Jeff Lagarias, and he's going to talk about complex Aki angular lines and the Stark conjecture. So you have the floor, Jeff. Thank you. Th thanks to the organizers um, for inviting me to speak in honor of Bob Moody on his 80th birthday. Um, I was all involved in a lot of aperiodic periodic order things, but uh, since I've been in Michigan, I've been um, uh, working in um, number three, and I, I want to talk about a, a problem in discrete ge geometry that overlaps um, physics and number theory, and possibly it even will turn out to connect to a periodic order someday. Um, so um, it's, a, it's an ex expository talk. It, it doesn't uh, feature any of my own work, although I am working with Gene Kopp on, on some follow-up things. It, it's an expository talk on the history of connections between topics in three areas in combinatorial design theory. It's the existence of ma maximal sets of complex equilangular lines. In, in quantum information theory, it corresponds to symmetric informationally complete positive operated measures or seek POVMs or seeks for short. Um, and the, the problem of, there's the problem of constructing these things as uh, orbits of a discrete Heisenberg group. Um, um, and physicists have been studying them for 20 years and they have uncovered a very strong connection with algebraic number theory uh, with class fields of real quadratic fields. And they put this, um, this was made, put on the web in the, in the mid 2015 and after. And the number theory part is exploring connections of this with the explicit constructions of class fields um, based on the stark conjectures for real quadratic fields. And that's uh, work of my former PhD student, Gene Kopp, that was started during his thesis. And so I, um, the, the, the work reported here includes results from his papers and PhD thesis. Um, and um, his thesis work was supported um, by the NSF. And so they, the talk has four pieces getting increasingly technical. The first piece is a histri history of e equilateral lines work, which started in the 1970s. The connection with quantum information theory due to Zauner um, was around 2000. And then the attempts to construct um, seeks um, have gone on from 2000 until 220. And they, the connection with the class fields with the algebraic num number theory was made in the, um, from uh, 2010 onward. And then finally, I'll, I'll describe the work of Kopp. So it's um, uh, the connection with the Stark conjectures. My interest in this is uh, Harold Stark was my PhD advisor. Um, so to begin with, uh, in equilateral lines. So combinatorial design theory is concerned with uh, regular geometric structures and the existence and constructions of finite sets whose arrangements have optimal balance or symmetry, for example, spherical codes. And a basic question is, what is the maximal set of lines through the origin in R to the D, the real case, or C to the D, the complex case that have pairwise equal angles? We call these equilangular lines. And the first answer is good upper bounds are known and they are sometimes sharp. So, so I will start with the real case. So Lemons and Seidel showed in the 19, early 1970s that they're at most D times D plus one over two um, equilangular lines in R to the D. Um, and they, their paper attributes the, the linear algebra proof to Michael Gerzon, um, um, who also, also designed uh, microphone arrays for uh, optimal concert performance. Um, 
And the data on this problem is the upper bound is known to be attained for two dimensions, two, three, seven, and 23. And it's infinitely many dimensions don't occur. Uh, D must be odd and it must, D plus two must be a perfect square. Um, it's conjectured, but never proved that only finitely many D meet the upper bound. And the, the list above is believed to be complete. Um, here, here is the data for some of these constructions. For R to the D in, 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 in D equals three, the six lines pass through the 12 vertices of an icosahedron with centroid at the origin. It's a symmetrical configuration with, with uh, uh, under the action of A5. In, in the case D equals seven, there's a configuration of 28 equilangular lines given by all the lines through the origin of the permutations of the two vectors, um, uh, plus or minus three, mi minus three, minus three, one, 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 one. Uh, and there's a transitive group action on the polytope with 56 vertices given by going unit distances in the directions from the origin. In the case D equals 23, construction is implicit in John Conway's 69 Invencioni's paper on uniqueness of the leech lattice. The, the 276 lines appear in there with a doubly transitive permutation representation of one of his simple groups, CO3. Why do we think there are only finitely many sets of real equiangular lines? Because if you just look at the, the problem, it's a, it's a real algebraic geometry problem, but you can count how many parameters. Um, if you believe there are D, um, D times D, D <clears throat> um, plus one over two lines, then uh, the number of freedom you have is, um, have I got this wrong now? Yes, probably. One half d cubed, d, d, d coordinates and one half d squared vectors will be one half d cubed real variables, but they they have to satisfy one eighth d, d to the fourth constraints because uh, every pair of lines has a has an angular constraint that's being imposed. So there, the number of constraints is growing faster than the number of variables. So the problem appears really overdetermined. And it is known there, there, are many more, there are many more relations among the constraints, but it doesn't appear to knock it down below, below the rate d to the fourth. Um, and furthermore, we see in the case that when you get equality in the, in the known cases, there's a group action with a transitive group. So now I come to the complex line case. So a, a complex line is a one-dimensional complex subspace uh, multiplying by the scalar C for a non-zero vector. Uh, and um, I will use the notation column vectors for V. So the Hilbert space, it's a Hilbert space and the scalar product uh, use the physics convention where you uh, take the complex conjugate on the left. Um, and so we define an angle, which is a real angle between two complex lines, CV and CW as being uh, cosine theta equal to the absolute value of the, of the Hilbert space product of W with V over the norm of V and the norm of W. And uh, we can always choose to normalize the vectors so they are of length one. So in, in what follows, I will implicitly assume V and W are of length one. And, that, and, then, and then we will assign an angle to, to um, each, each pair of lines. Now, a, a complex line is, is a, has two-dimensional real space. So, uh, but this was also treated by, this problem was also treated by the um, uh, design theorists um, in the 70s. Um, and Delsart, Gothel, and Seidel proved an upper bound. There are at most D squared angular lines in C to the D. Um, and they noted that the, the, the bound D squared is attained for D equals two and D equals three. And, and the, these are in uh, Coxeter's book on regular complex polytopes. There are some um, symmetry groups uh, running around 
on this problem. And um, I, I just want to say the vector space of all d by d real symmetric matrices has real dimension one half d times d plus one, which, which coincides with the real bound. But the Lie group of real orthogonal d by d matrices has real dimension one half d times d minus one. It's, it's slightly smaller. But when we go to the complex case, the, the real vector space of d by d complex Hermitian matrices has real dimension d squared, while the Lie group of complex unitary matrices also has real dimension d squared. So the number is equal. So the, the, the group actions a little bigger. So now, now, um, now I consider the connection with quantum information theory. So that this arose in a problem of um, finding a quantum analogs of designs for non-abelian groups and uh, complex the sets of Is that the maximal sets of uh, complex echelon lines are that notion is equivalent to the notion of seek, um, short for this seek POVM defined below. And this appeared in the um, thesis of Zauner in uh, 1999 at the University of Vienna. Um, because of the development of this subject, uh, that, that thesis became much more important. It's been translated to English in the, in the Journal of Quantum Information in uh, 2011. Uh, so here are the definition of seeks. So a positive operator valued measure over the Hilbert space C to the D is the set of M positive semi-definite D by D Hermitian matrices that sum to the identity matrix. Um, and a, a positive operator value measure is informationally complete if it spans the space of all self-adjoint operators, meaning Hermitian D by D matrices. And all set sets necessarily have dimension D squared, which is the dimension of the space of Hermitian D by D matrices. And finally, uh, an optimal thing, should it exist, a seek POVM, symmetric informationally complete positive operator valued measure is a set of D squared complex rank one orthogonal projection matrices, pi J, VJ, VJ dagger. So it's an outer product having the property that it has equal pairwise inner products trace pi i pi, pi j equals alpha when i does not equal j, and then one otherwise. So orthogonal projection and Hermitian projection uh, are, the, are the same concept. It's known if you have d squared, the angle is completely specified. Um, the, the trace has to be one over d plus one, and the cosine has to be the one, the square, one over the square root of alpha, which I think is on the next slide. So that notion is equivalent to constructing a set of D squared complex equilar angular lines with parameter alpha, because then you can take the orthogonal projections in the directions of the lines. Um, these, these are um, completely perfect extremal configurations if they exist. And so they've shown up in other contexts. In uh, design theory, they would be a tight complex projective two design and it gives a good uh, I think a good spherical quadrature formula. In terms of frame theory, it's a maximally equilangular tight frame. And in quantum information theory, it's, um, it's specified as being a minimal informationally complete set of measurements in the dimensions where it exists. Well, Zauner and his thesis came to the conclusion that uh, he conjectured that unlike the real case, seeks actually exist in all dimensions d bigger than or equal to one. And in particular, there is a seek constructed in a specific way as a 
as an orbit of a finite uh, group that will give a transitive action between the lines, the, the, the vial Heisenberg group in, in dimension D. So we conjectured there's a vial Heisenberg seek. And then finally, he conjectured that there's a vial Heisenberg seek that has an extra, an extra symmetry with, a, with an order three outer action in each dimension B greater than or equal to two. Um, uh, I'm not going to discuss the Zahner symmetry in this talk. Um, and as evidence for his conjecture, he exhibited solutions for D equals two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you know, these are low dimensions, just like, just like the real case. So uh, I think it was fairly brave to make that conjecture um, at that time. So now let, let me say what these uh, group actions are. So the discrete vial Heisenberg group, so we need in D dimension will be given by a set of um, 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 D by D um, unitary matrices and they have two generators X, which is a shift matrix as you see there and a, and a matrix Z that has uh, powers of roots of unity on along the diagonal. Um, and for odd dimensions D, the, the discrete Heisenberg group is generated by these two generators XC and it has order D cubed. And it, but, it, but it has a D dimension, but it has a center of order D acting by scalars on C to the D. So, if we, if we take an orbit with this thing, we would get D cubed lines, but they would be grouped in groups of D because multiplying by the scalar will not change the complex line. So we'll get exactly D squared in an orbit. And for even D, um, you need to increase the size of the center by, one, by, by an extra factor of two. So you take a zeta of two D times the identity is an extra generator. And then you get a group of order two D cubed but it has a center of order 2D. So again, the, the, the number of distinct lines you get in an orbit will be D squared, um, which is maximal. It, 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 in, in analyzing the, the, the orbits of this Heisenberg group, it's convenient to, to extract a set of uh, D, D squared generators that, is, that, will, that will give you cosets modulo the center. Um, um, these, these were introduced in physics. Um, um, so they are the unitary matrices, which are X to the M times Z to the N, X and Z don't commute. And um, there's a root of unity factor out front. Um, what, what's convenient about these displacement operators is that if you um, take products DMN by DPQ, then you get a additive shift, the D of M plus PN plus Q times a computable root of unity. Um, so DMN times V of a vector will give you um, copies of the D, D, D squared complex lines that are determined by a vial Heisenberg group orbit of a single vector V and C to the D. So a, a vial Heisenberg seek is any, any seek that we can obtain as a, as a orbit of a single column vector V mo modulo its center. And, such a generating vector is called a fiducial vector uh, in the physics literature. Um, and one can view the, um, that orbit is giving you the D squared complex lines given by the, uh, using these displacement vectors. Um, and there's um, some data associated with these lines, um, which are called uh, overlaps. They are the, the, the D squared minus one inner, inner products of um, uh, V with the displacement operators. And, and these, these complex numbers will have magnitude one over the square root of D plus one 
um, assuming you have a seek. Now, if you take a random vector V and you, and you move it around, you'll get these squared complex lines, but typically the angles are not all going to be equal. Um, and therefore the extra information to um, describe the particular fiducial vector you have that's giving you the seek is the collection of these D squared minus one phases. So, so there's, um, uh, which, which are termed overlap phases um, in the literature. Um, I should say that the, the, the overlap phases are sufficient um, to reconstruct to reconstruct the, the, the projection given by the fiducial vector. Now that, that um, Now there is a way to, um, once you have a single Heisenberg seek, there's a way to construct uh, a whole lot of other seeks, but I would like to um, summarize in advance that you will, you essentially will only get finitely many. There, there is an operation of rotating, uh, there's a, there is a continuous action of a unitary action of rotating all of the D squared vectors simultaneously. Uh, Without, without changing the angles. But if you remove that continuous symmetry, um, it, it appears there are only finitely many uh, of these things, except in dimension three. Um, so the first action we have on, on a seek is the action of the vial Heisenberg group on the left. And these, that action simply permutes the lines and, and therefore fixes the seek. There are some external actions. The, um, normalizer of the Heisenberg group inside the projective unitary group is, is also a finite group. And uh, it, 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 it gives an action on a seek and it may move, move the seek to a new seek or it might leave it fixed. And that, and that Zahner, the Zahner symmetry is in this and we can, um, um, I would also like to say there's an the anti-unitary operation of complex conjugate also possibly moves this the moves the seek to a possibly new seek. And taking all these things together with with the um, these geometric symmetries form a finite group inside the projective extended Clifford group, a non-matrix group, because you're allowing complex conjugation. Um, and the size of this finite group um, varies with the particular seek, even in a fixed dimension. Um, let me be careful there. Uh, let's just say the size of this group varies irregularly when changing dimension. Uh, in, in some case, there are seeks that uh, have fiducial vectors that are out that are consist of algebraic numbers, um, and if you have a if you have a fiducial vector that's algebraic numbers, then you can apply the the action of the Galois group of the rational numbers to convert it to a series of conjugate algebraic numbers, um, and sometimes when you do this, um, the new vector is itself the fiducial vector of another seek, and then. Sometimes it isn't. So this is an observation. Some of those Galois automorphisms of algebraic numbers take seeks to new sinks and other ones don't. And the ones that work are the automorphisms that commute with a complex conjugation. Um, the, this, the, I think this, this turns out to be very important uh, when the, when the uh, seek problem eventually gets solved as you will see. Uh, as I said before, I'm not giving any details. The overlap phases contain sufficient information to reconstruct the, the projection matrix of a fiducial vector. However, most combinations of overlap phases will not correspond to the fiducial vector of anything. So the, the overlap phases have to be incredibly special to actually give you the fiducial vector of a seek. And indeed, we have this question, do these, do vile Heisenberg seeks exist in all dimensions? 
At the moment, it's only known in finitely many dimensions. But again, the problem seems overdetermined. So we, we've certainly reduced the number of degrees of freedom um, by having the group action. We now have a single fiducial vector that will generate everything. And it has, it has two D complex coordinates, so it has two D real coordinates, okay? And, and furthermore, we only need to know the angles between that initial vector V and all the other vectors because of the group symmetry. Um, however, there are, there are d squared minus one other vectors, all required to be of modulus one over the square root of d plus one, and that imposes d squared minus one real constraints. So we have uh, d, d degrees of freedom and d, d squared constraints. So again, it appears that uh, the, the problem is tremendously overdetermined. And, um, and so far, the number of constraints um, the number of obvious geometric constraints seems to still grow like d squared. So uh, from this perspective, it, it's very surprising these things exist in high dimensions. Um, so now I would like to talk about the uh, uh, numerical work, the experimental numerical and theoretical work constructing bio Heisenberg seats. And Scott and Grassel made a very extensive numerical study as of 2010. They, they, they gave a possible complete list of all Weisen, um, Weil Heisenberg seeks to dimension 50, excluding dimension three. Um, in, dimension three is exceptional and has infinitely many solutions. So they have a large data set up to uh, dimension 67. Their preprint is posted on the web. Uh, it has 180 pages of tables, so there's 225 pages of data, and then the the the, the, the published paper has is um, smaller. Um, but they they obtain exact algebraic solutions up to dimension 15 and in dimension 24. That means they write down a fiducial vector that's a set of algebraic numbers, and then they can they can compute all the angles and compute everything exactly and verify that indeed. Um, it's equiangular. And then also by computer, they located non-exact numerical solutions um, um, up, up to 38 digits precision. They, they found co co complex coordinates of a putative fiducial vector and verified that it um, and um, for example, in, in dimension 23, they found six separate solutions. Um, they, they also computed the, the various Clifford group orbits and the, and the, and the actions, um, the uh, group actions, and they determined the number of fiducial vectors that are contained in an orbit under these outer automorphisms. Um, And uh, the numerical computation studies, which have now certainly gone up to dimension 100, um, actually proceed by solving an optimization problem. Um, and for this is a this is a numerical computation for bio Heisenberg seeks, where you're inputting a, a fiducial a vector and you're trying to convert it to be a, a fiducial vector. Um, and they use a result that for a unit vector in C to the D with entry, entries V1, V2 to VD, then um, this functional, um, the summation over J, K, and L of a, pro, of a quad, quadruple product of the VJs and the VJ bars quantity squared satisfies an inequality that, that it's always greater than or equal to two over D plus one. And equality is attained if and only if V is a fiducial vector. And so you can start with ran many random starting points and then do some um, sort of gradient descent algorithm with respect to F and attempt to get down to a minimizer that's a fiducial vector. Um, many, many local minima. And uh, 13 CPU years to do it for D equals 193. So here's a reference in Journal of Math Physics detailing 
examples. At the same time, um, Scott and Grassel observed that in their exact solutions, they were getting algebraic numbers. Um, and they observed that the um, something special about the algebraic numbers that were appearing in these fiducial vectors. They discovered that they, the uh, ratio of the coordinates, um, so that, that by taking ratios of, of, of pairs of coordinates, you, you remove that unitary symmetry. Um, they, uh, they found that the algebraic numbers they got were always in a number field generated by rav radicals having a solvable Galois group. And uh, they observed that they only needed extra square roots, cube roots, and fifths roots, not counting the roots of unity. Um, and they used Grubner basis computations, MATLAB, PARI GP, plus Scott's code for function minimization. And their paper gives you the degree, the number field, and the Galois groups. And they classify solutions with Zauner symmetry. And um, they de determine the group orbits. So now I come to Marcus Appleby, who has been, been studying this problem with many uh, authors. Um, and he observed that um, he studied the, the, he returned to these from studying the Galois theory of the, of the algebraic numbers that were appearing in the Scott and Grassel data. Um, and the first observation he made is that the, the they have a normal series where G and H are abelian extend index and the index of G and H is two. Um, and in order for this observation to be true, there was a discrepancy. It disagreed with the data for D equals 14. So he went back to Scott and Grassel and told them to look, look over that and, and a correction was found there was, there was a mistake, and indeed, the observation was true even for d equals 14. Um, the, the next observation, which is sort of the crucial observation, is that if you, if you looked at the field generated by the uh, ratios of entries to the fiducial vector, and you added a root of unity, uh, that was their... The, uh, the, uh, the, for the even Heisenberg group, then in all cases, they found that the, the fields they got for the different seek uh, fiducial vectors were always abelian extensions of a real quadratic field that dependent on the dimension D. And it's the, it's the square root of D plus one times D minus three. <laughs> and where did that come from? I, the real, the real quadratic, that real quadratic field is a rather special real quadratic field that contains a very small fundamental unit. But in particular, when it's given in its parametric form, it contains a unit d minus one plus the square root of d over two, which is also of positive norm. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the fundamental unit. Um, as, as it's gonna turn out, the dimension is important so this unit has the property that its cube is congruent to one mod D, which perhaps has something to do with the Zauner symmetry. Uh, um, it, um, it's, it's important later on you know, when in COPS work, it was important to know that you can, you can classify all the algebraic units in that quadratic field that are one mod D and they are, they are cubes of, un, of the uh, given unit. Um, Appleby, Flamia, McConnell, and Yard um, since wrote a follow-up paper because the observation made by Appleby was that the, the field generating the coefficients of a fiducial vector was an abelian extension of a real quadratic field. So that, that, that falls in the Hilbert program of class field theory of, of classifying all abelian extensions of algebraic number fields. Um, and so they wrote a paper generating ray class fields of real quadratic fields via complex equiangular lines. Um, and, and it was put on the archive in 2016 uh, when 
uh, Gene Kopp was writing his thesis. Um, and so both he and I noticed this paper and it was relevant to what he was doing in his thesis. So he studied it and that led to um, the later work I'm gonna describe. So there's, um, this paper formulates more precise conjectures about the nature of the class fields, the abelian extensions that appear in the coordinates of a vial Heisenberg seek for D bigger than or equal to four. Well, where D bigger than four comes from is that the, the quadratic field is the square root of D plus one times D minus three. So that gives you a real quadratic field whenever D is bigger than or equal to four. And D three is exceptional because the discriminant is then zero, which says you, you're over the rational numbers. So it's not surprising that something um, unusual happens in dimension three from the viewpoint of this family of fields. And in dimensions two and one, the, the value of that delta D is minus two, is um, minus three and minus four, I believe is what occurs. Um, and those are the two imaginary quadratic fields with extra units. Um, so the, those, those, those are also special. And um, they went through all the existing data and they, and they and they determine the, the field for, for one seek in each of the tw of 24 different dimensions um, for D bigger than or equal to four. Um, and that particular seek they were using is the so-called minimal multiplet, um, which as it will, it appears that this is the one that will have the smallest degree number field, this particular, um, 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 by Heisenberg seek. And in that case, they determined that the relevant class field was the Ray class field of, of the Q of the square root of minus D with, with conductor ideal D, which at least explains how the dimension is getting into this problem. Um, and then if you're a number theorist, there are some extra conditions on what, what, it, what this class field has at the real places. Um, Now I, I I have to say it's it's very surprising that not only that number theory comes into this problem but that it comes in in such a complicated way. Okay, and the the seeks in dimensions one, two, and three are exceptional, and those are the three cases where you don't have a real quadratic field. Uh, and it's it's known there's a one infinite one parameter family of uh, infinitely many non-isomorphic seeks in, in dimension three. Um, besides, besides these dimensions one and two being exceptional, in dimension eight, there's an ex another exceptional solution, uh, the Hogar lines, uh, which is an orbit of another, of another transitive group action, not the Weil-Heisenberg group action. Uh, and here are some data for fiducial vectors. Um, the, the fiducial vector for D equals two, you can take four vertices of a regular tetrahedron with origin at the centroid. Um, and in dimension three, you can, you can make the vector rational up to a scaling. The, the, the scaling of one over the square root of two is in there only to give you a, a unit length vector. Um, and it's known that the vial Heisenberg seek for that one is a subset of nine of the 27 lines on a, on a Hesse cubic. I guess I have been racing through these slides. So, so let me go on to the stark conjectures um, and the work of Gene Cobb. This, this work was uh, serendipitous. Um, so in, in a series of papers in the period 1971 to 1918, uh, Harold Stark, my advisor, conjectured formulas for the leading term in the Taylor expansion at S equals one for various L functions. 
uh, originally art and L functions of Galois extensions and number fields, but these can be expressed in terms of heck L functions, uh, uh, which, which are more the kind of thing you will use for computing. Um, and he proved these conjectures in many cases. Um, Hecka and Art and L functions have a functional equation that, that um, maps their entire or meromorphic functions, sometimes having a poles at s equals one and s equals zero. Um, but they have a they have a functional equation that that maps s to one minus s. And and therefore the Taylor expansions at s equals one can be converted to Taylor expansions at s equals zero. Um, um, using the functional equations. And it turns out the formulas for the, uh, for the values at s equals zero are often simpler than the ones at s equals one. Um, but numerically, sometimes it's easier to, some things can be, be um, com computed more naturally at s equals one. Um, and Stark started out with S equals one, and then partway through, he switched in his papers to doing things at S equals zero, possibly due to interaction with uh, John Tate, um, who has a, a book on the, these, these values. So that, and one, one is interested in the largest non-zero term in the Taylor um, expansion. Um, the, the S equals zero case, of course, is, um, occurs, um, there are analogous things in, in, in physics in the uh, Atiyah Singer index theorem where you evaluate things at s equals zero and it can assign topological and other meaning to it. So s, s equals zero is preferred. Um, now, um, some of the motivation for a lot of this work is Hilbert's uh, a long range motivation in number theory is Hilbert's 12th problem, which is the problem of extension of Kronecker's theorem about abelian fields to any algebraic realm of rationality. Um, so the kronecker weber theorem states that the abelian extensions of the base field Q are generated by the values of the exponential values at, at rational values of Z. That is to say, they're generated by the roots of unity. Um, that is the, the maximal abelian extension of the rationals can be created by adjoining all the roots of unity to the, to the algebraic number field. Um, and since they were generated by the exponential, Hilbert asked for new analytic functions, which in more general cases could play the role of exponential. Um, and he was aware of the theory of complex multiplication for elliptic modular functions uh, and uniformizing elliptic curves at the time. And that, and that were, and that the complex multiplication was, had been underway and it was uh, developed uh, more completely in the decade from 1900 to 1910. And in that, in that version, various modular functions appear, uh, play the role of the exponential. Um, so they are again, analytic functions with extra symmetry. Um, on the other hand, a, a um, a general class field theory, um, not directly constructed, was found by Takagi for all number fields, but not, not with a recipe to actually produce numbers in the number fields. Um, the complex multiplication case gives, a, a, gives a, an effect, an explicit class field theory for totally imaginary extensions of totally real fields. Um, the, so they, the, so that covers the imaginary quadratic case, field case, which was the case where complex multiplication was classically developed. Um, the simplest open case in this um, direction is the real quadratic field case, which has remained open up, up to this day. And the, the conjectures of Stark lead to a, a, a kind of solution for, for many ray classes in, um, in, in the real quadratic case in particular for this theories for totally real fields, 
And they used various L functions as the analytic functions and evaluating them at specific points as the recipe for constructing generating elements of the, of the class fields. Um, in, in this real quadratic field case, um, uh, very important recent progress has been made by Dasgupta and Kakte in that um, there's a more Stark conjectures involved, the Brumer Stark conjecture, and there will be an ICM address by Dasgupta on this problem. And you can find uh, two of their papers on the archive. Um, in the last year, um, summarizing that direction. It, it uses p-adic methods and, and, and p-adic functions, so it doesn't uh, use uh, classical analytic functions. Uh, for, the, for the case at hand, um, when, when, you have an, when you're trying to get an abelian extension of a number field and the order of vanishing of the L function at, at S equals zero is one, the rank one case, this is the one main case where the Stark conjecture um, can, can really be tested numerically. The Stark's conjecture predicts that the derivative of the L value at S equals zero is the logarithm of an algebraic number. So you can numerically compute the derivative of the L value at S equals zero. Um, and then you can exponentiate your answer. So you get exponential of L, L prime of zero, and that putatively is going to be an algebraic number. And then you can attempt to find the, uh, the coefficients of that algebra, the, the, the coefficients of the minimal polynomial of that algebra of that number with a lattice basis reduction algorithm. And um, in that way, you can get a good guess what it is. Uh, His, his conjectures predict this algebraic number is, a, is almost a unit, and particularly it is, in the real quadratic case, he has a, is, is a conjecture, they're always units. Um, but what's interesting is even though these conjectures have never been proved, and there are many examples since the 1970s of explicit calculations where they can guess the number to 100 decimal places, but they can't prove it. Um, but it's already being used in the PARI GP computer algebra system for computing Hilbert class fields because you, when this, when this case occurs, because you can compute that derivative to high precision, you can exponentiate it, and then you can find algebraic, near, algebraic numbers nearby, algebraic integers. And once you have the algebraic integer, you can find the field that generates, and then you can, uh, you can ex post facto verify it's the Hilbert class field by checking that that field has the required properties. Um, that it's unramified over K, that it's abelian has the proper degree. That, that can be checked by known algorithms once you have a specific, specific number to plug in. So it's actually used in the package. That, uh, so when, when, uh, when, when Gene Kopp was uh, my graduate student, he was interested in, um, analytic things having to do with um, in, indefinite quadratic forms and theta functions attached to indefinite quadratic forms and Mellon transforms of these things, which are indefinite zeta functions, which had not uh, previously been studied. Um, and he, he treats um, indefinite theta functions he adds extra parameters. These, these can be used to add extra parameters into the, into the L functions. Um, and it permits new contour integral def deformations that uh, are useful for theory and for numerical computation. Um, and in particular, although, although these, these functions aren't well understood, they can certainly be used to compute special values of L functions at S equals zero and S equals one, relevant to the star conjectures. And, and, and he, was, he was doing programming to compute these values, particularly at S equals one. Um, And when this, uh, when the Appleby et al. paper appeared in 2016 with this, with this connection um, to uh, the Stark and the Stark conjectures, and he was doing experiments anyway on these functions for computing special values related to Stark conjectures, um, he, he discovered that one Stark unit that he had computed as a test example actually 
in a certain, by a certain recipe corresponded to a seek in dimension D equals five, associated at Q the square root of minus three. And this Stark unit, which is the real unit, uh, one could recover the squares of the overlap phases. That is twice, twice the overlap phase. So you have to take a square root in order to, um, there's, there's an ambiguity in determining the square root. But uh, aside from that, um, this recipe had, um, took various Galois conjugates of this unit, um, obtaining complex units. So the Stark unit is a real unit, and we're looking at complex secular angular lines. You need, you need, you expect to see complex things, and it's not occurring with the original unit. It's occurring with the, the Galois conjugates of the unit. Uh, so in effect, um, as I said, under these under these Galois symmetries applied to a to a fiducial vector, sometimes you get another fiducial vector when you apply the symmetry, and sometimes you don't. So what's going on here is sort of in the reverse direction. Sometimes you don't, but the star could, but the thing that's being produced when you don't might have a connection with the star conjectures. Right. Um, so initially some trial and error was required in taking the square root, but uh, eventually he determined that there, there's a side congruence condition mod D that you can impose on something there what, that allows you to completely specify the square root. So apparently you have a recipe to get a seek in, in for D equals five this way. And, and he also had a second example uh, where, where he could do it. Well, was this an accident? Uh, okay, so this is, the, this is uh, the, the example that goes with the seek of, of dimension five, so of uh, D equals five. So here, here, is the, here is the putative identity um, in, in, well, I'll get to the recipe later, but on the left-hand side, you have, a, you have an indefinite quadratic form in the denominator, three, three M squared minus N squared. And you have, a, you have some character, a difference of two character values in the top and ostensibly evaluated at S equals one, this should be equal to pi times I to the square root of three times logarithm of a unit. And this real unit is a solution to the following eighth degree equation with, with coefficients over the square root of three there. And that root of that equation is an algebraic unit in the ray class field of the Q the square root of three modulo the ray ideal five, which is the, which is the dimension and then one infinite place. Okay, and this inequality is part of the Stark conjectures. This is covered by Stark's rank one conjecture and it's unproved. Um, you also notice that this is a log of a unit times a fudge factor of pi i over the square root of three. So if you did the functional equation and map that to s equals zero, it, it would remove the prefactor and it would leave you with something like log epsilon. Um, the, uh, for those of you who know these functional equations, they have a pi to the minus s times say a gamma, a gamma factor times a um, in, in this case, something like uh, three, three to the S over two that has to do with the uh, discriminant, the associated thing. In order to, um, after, after he graduated, um, Gene continued to work on these problems and he um, found a, an exact recipe for sometimes constructing seeks, which is conjectural and depends on the, on part of it depends on the Stark conjecture and part of it requires more. So this is the class field theory, part of the background. So a class field theory attempts to classify um, class groups, um, Now that I'm checking the time, I will simply say you have a ray class group, which is fractional ideals with a modulus M and some infinite data that's S and you mod out by principal ideals that are one mod N and have correct, correct signs for the real part. And associated to each class group, class field theory says it's an abelian extension, the ray class field, 
which is an abelian extension whose Galois group is isomorphic canonically to the Ray class group, which is data in the bottom field. So our bottom field K is a real quadratic field and the modulus M will be D with one infinite place. And the theorem of Takagi says, if you vary over all Ray classes and you take the union of all of that, then you will get all abelian extensions of, of uh, the um, round field. Attached to Ray classes, you can attach um, L functions or Ray class uh, zeta functions that sum norm of ideals over an ideal over over an ideal class. So that's that's a Ray class zeta function. These these Ray class zeta functions have a pole at s equals one. You want to get rid of the pole, so you take a difference of two of them that cancels the singularity at the pole, and that is done by subtracting off a a um, another a second Ray class um, that's shifted from the first one by a particular ray that includes a negative modulus and that's the z sub a of s and now once you've done that you can state one of the rank one abelian stark conjectures over a real quadratic field um, um, starks there's some i'm phrasing this in terms of the um, l functions that cop uses and, and not the ones that um, Stark uses, which are which are slightly different. But anyway, the upshot of the this, in view of the time, let me say that the the, the upshot of the Stark conjecture was that if you for Ray class moduli that have that have one one split case, uh, one 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 real place, and with an um, and <clears throat> for our, for ideals with uh, with uh, some constraint on the um, signs on one mod m, then this derivative of the Stark function at zero will be logarithm of a real unit. Um, that real unit will generate the corresponding Ray class field. And you get a bunch of these units, one for each, um, one for each ray class. And as you, as you vary the ray classes, they, they become algebraic conjugates of a single unit uh, under the Artin map of class field theory, which assigns to a ray class a Galois element, um, which is all right. Well, now um, Stark uh, Cop in IMRN in 2021, wrote a paper which gives a, a putatively exact recipe for computing a, a seek attached to some Stark unit data. So the surprise in this is not that you, that, that, that you can come, that, uh, um, that the big surprise I think is that it's, it's not that the star conjectures succeed in generating the right field, but somehow the actual units they produce seem to be closely related to what you actually need to make a, to make a seek. That was the completely serendipitous thing. Um, so this precise conjecture says, if you have deltas d plus one and times d minus three and d is two mod three and is a prime, um, then you then you can concoct d squared minus one conjugate units um, using this. Um, if if there exists in this number, if there exists uh, a, a real unit in a in a given class field under the action of the of of the Artin map, and then if it satisfies some identities, so these are the identities these conjugate units have to satisfy. First of all, their square roots remain. The square roots d plus one times x squared remain in the same field. And then for a particular choice of sign in the square root, you can take a linear combination of the displacement operators to produce a rank one item. Well, it's a rank one oblique projector. It's an item potent m squared equals m. It's in c to the d. And it's being produced from these Stark units, which are real units. 
On the other hand, there's a, there's a Gawa automorphism, which will send that uh, does not commute with, there's a Gawa automorphism sending it to complex stuff. And then under the complex action, you get a copy of the sigma of M, which is actually a rank one Hermitian projector. Um, that's that's the this, so this is a this is a star conjecture with extra assumptions that some amazing identities hold. The P two and P three are amazing extra identities that hold in this case. Well, that's what the conjecture says, and that works on this special unit that I showed you earlier. It's the real root of this equation. So when you take complex conjugation, um, it takes the it takes the polynomial it satisfies and applies complex conjugation to the coefficients, uh, which flips all the signs. And then you get a new equation. So the, the conjugated unit um, is, is satisfying a different equation over, over Q to the square root of minus three, um, over Q to the square root of three. And it has the following property. These two polynomials have the feature that one of them has all real roots and the other one has all complex roots lying on the unit circle. And these complex roots are not roots of unity. Uh, so, uh, and it's it's the complex root side of it that's producing the data that apparently gives um, the um, stuff for a seek. So, um, uh, in particular, and it's five mod six. Um, he. Um, he shows that if, if you have a prime in five mod six and it obeys those identities, then you construct a seek. That's, that's the first theorem um, in conjecture one. Um, and that, the extra identities are not implied by the star conjectures. They are just asserted in this case and they function as a miracle that gives you the extra relations that apparently allows you to um, construct a seek, even though there is too many, um, too many degrees of freedom, not enough degrees of freedom. And then uh, Cobb's second conjecture is that um, you can explicitly find a unit that has the properties above by, by explicitly constructing as a Stark unit from an L function. Uh, re really, this is, uh, this is just amazing. Well, how much evidence for it? Well, there's uh, one, one piece of evidence. Well, there's more now, but there's a... Um, uh, he verified those two conjectures um, for 5, 11, 17, and 23. So the next case after that is uh, 29. Um, and he produced exact seeks in these dimensions following that recipe. And th these seeks were known in 5, 11, and 17, but he got a different representation of them. Uh, um, and he found the, the first exact seek in dimension 23 by this recipe. And I, I want to say that it's, it's, it's scientific. The data was form the conjectures are formulated based on 5, 11, 17, and then they were tested after the fact on 23. Um, uh, now what? Okay. So I'm. I'm out of time, so let me say um, the the Ray class group, the field of definition of the seek here is of degree 704, and the unit group is gigantically large for such a thing. And and the fact that these particular units does the job in such a it's a needle in a very large haystack, it's very surprising. Um, and this this explains only part of the d equals 23 data of Scott and Gressel. Okay. So, so to summarize, this, uh, the connection with class field theory of real quadratic fields is really amazing. Um, they're, they're offering a prize to prove the existence of Weil Heisenberg seeks in infinitely many dimensions. And somehow this problem and the answer is, if it exists, it's really complicated compared with how simple the geometric problem is. Um, it's fascinating and fundamental. Okay, and the work has exhibited a back and forth process of discovery going from theory to experiment and more theory and more experiment. Um, and it's, it's connected to two very, very important problems. And it, it gives a wedge to get on, um, to make progress on both of them. And there, there's been a lot of progress since then, but it's, but it's not written up. Okay, thank you. <laughs>